ये लोग कितने खुश दिख रहे हैं ना आ, खुश तो है और आप मैं भी खुश पर ये लोग खुश क्यों हैं दादू क्योंकि ये लोग आजाद हैं और आप मेरे पास भी आजादी है कहा मेरी आजादी मेरी जेब में क्या कह रहे हो दादू आजादी और जेब में दिखाओ कैसी होती है आजादी ये हाँ ये है मेरे आजादी की निशानी Azadi means freedom. Freedom means different things to different people. Most of us have simple dreams of freedom which evolve and change along with environments, circumstances and times. But however we look at it, freedom can and does have only one meaning the freedom to choose someone once said the strongest principle of growth lies in human choice this is the tale of a dramatic and emotional journey of 62 years of free choice it all began when at the stroke of the midnight hour when the world sleeps india will awake to life and freedom When India chose the republican form of government and universal franchise the prophets of doom described it as the biggest gamble in history the finishing line is yet to come but at this moment we can surely pause to smell the roses we can take a step back and say looks like the gamble paid off In Western democracies, adult franchise was extended in stages to men of property, then to educated men, later to all men, and finally to women as well. With its instant promise of universal adult franchise, Free India took its first leap. India is a hierarchical society. Within Indian culture, whether in the north or the south, Hindu or Muslim, urban or village, in fact in virtually all things, people and groups of people are ranked according to various dogma, handed down from one generation to the next. With the first election, India broke free of this deeply entrenched social tradition. What a humbling sight. The privileged and the marginalized standing in the same line waiting to cast their vote. The freedom to choose is fundamental to a democracy. India took another huge leap. Every person who is a citizen of India has the right to vote. Unlike some other democracies, if he has the right to vote, he also has the right to stand for elections be it for the highest political post in the country anyone can become a candidate if he is not disqualified by law candidates in india span a wide spectrum of backgrounds castes religions and status the panorama includes former royalty cinema and tv stars religious holy men war heroes and even the man on the street meet die hard optimist balram bari 
a tea stall owner in the walled city of Delhi. An astrologer had once told him that he would fight his first election when he was 25 and would enjoy political power when he turned 43. He turns 43 next year. He has fought elections 11 times and he has lost all 11 of them. But the twinkle in his eye is not lost when he says, that means I win either this time or in the next Lok Sabha polls. Campaigns utilize not only high-tech, big money communications, ranging from the latest video van with two-way screens, but also the traditional door-to-door -door visits, as well as word-of-mouth publicity. Today, India has all the hallmarks of an energetic, pulsating, vibrant democracy. The world calls it a miracle, but India knows better. It has been a tough and tumultuous journey riddled with unimaginable complexities and challenges that may seem bewildering to the modern mind. Naam? Ramji Lal ki patni. Tumhara naam kya hai? Arre kaha to Ramji Lal ki patni. It's hard to imagine, but yes, there was a time when in many regions of India, women knew themselves and were known by others only in terms of their relationships to the men in their lives. The father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, had said, In a true democracy, every man and woman is taught to think for himself or herself. It was a lesson well learned. पहली बार वोट डाला मुझे वोट डाल के बहुत अच्छा लगा मुझे लगा कि मैं बड़ी हो गई हूं और मैं अच्छे बुरे का फैसला ले सकती हूं मैं आज लिब्रेट हो चुकी हूं मुझे ऐसा लग रहा है टुडे इंडियन वुमेन हैव मोर देन जस्ट एन आइडेंटिटी ऑफ देयर ओन बट व्हाट इज एज्ड इन इंडियाज हिस्टोरिकल मेमोरी इज द ग्रेट लाइंस ऑफ वुमेन अलोंग विद मेन स्नेकिंग थ्रू द डर्ट रोड्स एंड स्ट्रीट्स गोइंग टू वोट फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम ओल्ड वुमेन who had waited at least half a century to cast their first vote, saying that they felt like human beings for the first time. Multi-hued and lively in more ways than one, Indian elections have had many amazing moments and well-defined milestones. Elections in the 1950s were carried out using different ballot boxes for each candidate. Different coloured boxes represented different parties. Ever heard of 1,033 candidates for a single seat? Believe it or not, it happened in the Modakuruchi Assembly constituency in Tamil Nadu in 1996. The ballot paper with the symbols of the aspiring candidates was a booklet that ran to 60 pages. Awesome? Sure. All-inclusive? Certainly. Liberal. Of course. And let's not forget participatory. In the 2004 general elections, there were 1,351 candidates from six national parties, 801 candidates from 36 state parties, 898 candidates from officially registered parties and 2,385 independent candidates. The oldest candidate was 94 years old. He won. The youngest elected MP is 26 years old. What a heartwarming sight. The young and the old walking hand in hand to bridge the generation gap. A beautiful mix of youth and experience. The Indian experience is that electoral democracy is essential to manage the diverse aspirations of a plural society. In fact, it is the best tool to bring about political change without upheaval, violence and bloodshed. 
elections in India are sacrosanct. They are fervent. They are intrinsic to Indian culture. An ancient civilization. India is perhaps the only one in world history to be living on and continuing to thrive. Wise people have lots to say on that endurance of India. The Western philosopher Will Durant once said, India was the mother of our race and Sanskrit the mother of Europe's languages. She was the mother of philosophy, mother through Buddha, of the ideals embodied in Christianity, mother through village communities of self-government and democracy. Mother India is in many ways the mother of us all. The history of India shows ample evidence of a deeply rooted democracy. Today, that root has blossomed and is here to spread its fragrance. The mainstay of this democratic journey from fledgling to skilled lies in India's undying commitment to the electoral process. I think that in the totality, the way we conduct the elections, the micromanagement of elections, the details the election commission goes into, the increasing maturity of the political processes, the increasing maturity of the electorate. You see, it, it can't just be a commission. It has to be a totality of a whole country that is involved. Given the overwhelming and unique conditions of the nation, each election in modern India is an epic undertaking. It is without doubt the largest event management exercise in the world. Can you imagine four European countries like Italy, France, Switzerland and Holland with a combined population of more than 140 million holding a general election together under the management of one organization? The very thought can be daunting. In India, it is a bigger reality. The state of Uttar Pradesh alone with a population of more than 190 million is larger than that of those four countries put together. Can anyone do the math of this massive operation and see the picture? India creates this picture and lives the story every five years. Look at it another way. It's almost like the whole of America and Europe getting ready to vote under the aegis of one organization. In India, more than 389 million people voted out of an electorate size of more than 671 million. The figures can be mind-blowing. Indian elections entail organizing and supervising about 700 million voters in around 800,000 polling stations spread across widely varying geographic and climatic zones. Polling stations are located in the towering, snow-clad Himalayan peaks the deserts of Rajasthan, the vast Gangetic Plains, the coastal regions further south and in the sparsely populated islands in the Indian Ocean. India is the world's largest electoral democracy and its general elections, scattered over almost two months, represent a triumph of organizational skill and will. Politics is something of a passion and perhaps nowhere in the world are elections so fundamentally a zealously living and contested thing as in India. The elections here bring together all kinds of other differences, whether it's caste or class or religion. It, um, on, on the day of voting, everyone's a voter and it's that one most egalitarian and equal thing that we have. And elections in India are often uh, like a mela, but the colour around them should not undermine uh, their, their deep, deep importance uh, in, because they're the only mechanism available by which uh, the ordinary person uh, can have a stake in the system. The very fact that India has repeatedly and regularly mounted general elections since 1947 
and on a scale never before witnessed in history, bears testament to the strength of Indian democracy. Indian parliamentary elections cannot be compared to any polls happening anywhere in the world. Its population, which exceeds 1 billion, presents the most extraordinary contrasts. The cultural and demographic diversities themselves present intimidating challenges. The people of this vast country speak nearly a thousand languages, follow several different faiths and are congregated in hundreds of different ethnic and caste communities. As Mark Twain so aptly put it, India is the cradle of the human race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of history, the grandmother of legend and the great-grandmother of tradition. Historical traditions, architectural marvels, the chronicles of kings and the exploits of numerous invaders testify to the complexity of Indian history. To speak of Indian culture is to speak of long traditions of music, art, architecture, dance, sculpture and of course all those signs, gestures and symbols by means of which people create meaningful, symbolic, silent communication. Today, India is an extraordinary amalgamation of the new thrown into the traditional mix. The constitution makers of India had dared to dream. They were visionaries who knew they had to create a workable mechanism that would reconcile the myriad and mind-boggling contradictions of the nation to create an awe-inspiring democracy. Intense deliberation and the measured stoke of a pen created a neutral and independent body to conduct, manage and oversee the election process. The Election Commission of India was born on January 25, 1950. The men who ran the place knew from the very beginning that ensuring free, fair and transparent elections was their key to periodic and smooth transitions of power. The Election Commission employs almost 7 million polling personnel to run the election. A vast number of civilian police and security forces are deployed to protect everybody's right to vote. Recognizing the electoral process as the strongest pillar of democracy, the constitution gave the election commission a unique, independent, high-powered role. The Election Commission functions along the lines of the College of Justices at the Supreme Court. In fact, the proceedings to disqualify a candidate can look like a hearing at the Supreme Court. The three commissioners reach a decision in a collegial manner. The Constitution envisages that the Election Commission alone should have the final word in every respect even if there be any controversy or dispute requiring resolution, that can be taken up after the election process has been concluded. India is considered to be a tolerant society. The Election Commission of India, however, cannot afford to be tolerant. In fact, it has developed a zero tolerance level for any kind of electoral malpractice. How else can it conduct elections in a country that firmly believes in and cherishes the principles of pluralism. Indian elections represent an amalgamation of plural thoughts, plural religions, plural customs, plural languages and plural needs. However plural the outlook though, there is full-blooded unity in one conviction. The ballot box is important and every vote counts. Going to the polls, Indians believe, is like a spiritual exercise that can bring a positive change. It may be with just one vote, but it counts. 
the nation accords great respect to each vote and the Indian Election Commission goes to unimaginable lengths to record it. Now we have polling stations where there's only one voter. So quite a few, I mean, three, four polling stations. I remember one um, in the state of Kerala. An entire day, our uh, polling party waited so that at his, at his own choose time of choice, the voter came and voted. So for one voter, this polling station is maintained. In a unique experiment, the Election Commission introduced six mobile booths in the inaccessible areas of Barmer and Jaisalmer in Rajasthan. This was the first time that such booths would be crisscrossing the far-flung areas of the district. The mobile booths were a huge success. Finding a period when elections can be held throughout the country is not simple. The Election Commission has to take account of the weather. During winter, constituencies may be snowbound, while in the monsoon, access to remote areas can become restricted. Then, there is the agricultural cycle to be considered, so that the planting or harvesting of crops is not disrupted. Schools are used as polling stations and teachers employed as election officials. So, exam schedules have to be kept in mind. Also, there are religious festivals and public holidays. Law and order plus availability and movement of central police forces also factors in. It's like walking a tightrope when logistical difficulties are also added to the mix. The electoral role is the backbone of the entire exercise. It is normally revised every year. To improve the accuracy of the electoral roll and prevent electoral fraud, the Election Commission ordered photo identity cards for all voters in August 1993. In 1998, the Commission took a historic decision to computerize the entire electoral rolls. With a simple announcement of election dates, the Election Commission shifts gear from macro to micro mode management inside and outside, the carnival begins. With public participation in the process, the elections virtually turn into a strange admixture of war and festivities. Vibrant colours, dramatic hoardings, spectacular caravans, larger-than-life effigies, all stops are pulled out. The Election Commission also turns into the epicentre of battle. A virtual war zone comes into existence. The officers and staff work incessantly towards a just culmination of this battle. A model code of conduct evolved by the Election Commission on the basis of a consensus among political parties comes into play as soon as the elections are announced. What is astounding is that ancient India had devised and put into place a fairly elaborate code of conduct for those who wished to contest elections for advisory roles to the king. The Chola inscriptions in the 10th century have a code that seems to have the same basic ingredients as the modern Indian code. Sounds like history repeating itself. The Election Commission appoints a large number of observers to ensure that the campaign is conducted fairly and that people are free to vote as they choose. Humans being human and thus fallible, aberrations do creep in. There are incidents of money power, muscle power and mafia power that come into play. Criminalization, corruption, communalism, and casteism are not far behind. I think the biggest challenge still is to check money power in elections. We were uh, grappling with the muscle power and money power initially. We have been able to control muscle power substantially, I, or, I think almost totally. But money power, uh, we feel uh, we have a lot to do. The other challenge is that uh, voter participation needs to increase, particularly in urban areas. 
contrary to public perception, in spite of illiteracy and poverty, the rural uh, voters participate in large numbers. It is the so-called uh, educated elite who are very indifferent to the election process. Every state has its own problems. Uttar Pradesh and Bihar faced a great deal of rigging and booth capturing, which the Election Commission has helped to end with strategic intervention. Other states face communal and caste problems and other tensions. Northeast and Jammu and Kashmir face militancy. What rewarding moments for Indians to watch on television. Hordes of voters in Kashmir defying boycotts and threat calls to press buttons on the electronic voting machines in the 2004 elections. How breathtaking to hear the sounds of democracy suffocate the sounds of guns booming in the nearby hills. Whatever the problems, the mood of the nation during the days of voting is buoyant. It's like a nation reborn. Even the logistical difficulties of the voting, misplaced ballots, rumours of fraud cannot dim the overwhelming victory for democracy and justice. This is one of the most important moments in the life of the country. Pride, identity of the common man, power to the people. In the wisdom of the Indian people is the source of India's renewal. Any assault on Indian democracy is avenged by him time and again. The ruling party was thrown out in 1977, 1980 and in several elections since then, including the election of 2004. The media are encouraged and provided with facilities to cover the election. In fact, the media is the biggest watchdog and ally that the Election Commission has. If the Election Commission is, uh, is playing the role of a neutral umpire during the great Indian elections, the media is playing the role of a third umpire, monitoring and ensuring that all the decisions taken by the Election Commission are within the rules of the game and also ensuring, in a sense, that all the players who are out there, all the politicians, are also playing by the rules that have been set by the Election Commission. The three-member Indian Election Commission has gone from strength to strength. In fact, very few election commissions in the world have such wide-ranging powers. Pulsating with energy and dynamism, the Indian Election Commission has provided experts and observers for elections to other countries in cooperation with the United Nations and the Commonwealth Secretariat. India is a founding member of the United Nations Democratic Fund as well as the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance. Election officials and delegates from several countries have visited the Commission for a better understanding of the Indian electoral process. The Election Commission of India has an extraordinary international reputation. In fact, um, I remember talking to the former Algerian Foreign Minister, Lakhdar Brahimi, when we were setting up the mechanisms in Iraq for the United Nations. And his first thing is, why are we going to any Western countries? The best election experts in the world are the Election Commission of India, let's go there. That's the sort of reputation that uh, the Indian Election Commission has acquired over the years, and it's richly deserved. As the largest democracy, India has a great responsibility to preserve, protect, and fine-tune the system and thereby showcase it to the rest of the world. India's continuing success is perhaps crucial to the future of democracy. In fact, in keeping with times, Indian elections have gone completely high-tech. 2004 saw the creative and pioneering use of GIS technology for electoral management in the troubled Naxalite area of Orissa. Since it's being a forest area, we felt that the geographic information system would be a better answer uh, to map the entire route. So using this technology, the entire forest area, uh, the, all the important of infrastructure like school buildings, uh, clinics and hospitals, uh, everything was uh, mapped on the GIS. This is like another feather in India's already ornate cap and unique to India. Can anyone imagine remote villages in India 
that have never used electricity or seen a radio or TV or heard the wheels of a train chugging. These modern facilities may not have reached them yet, but the electronic voting machine or the EVM certainly has. The 2004 general elections stand out in the history of election management in India, if not the whole world. Indians saw the countrywide use of electronic voting machines for the first time. 1.07 million EVMs were used in 700,000 polling stations. Most election results were announced in less than a day. The story of the EVM in India is no ordinary success story. It is like a jewel in India's electoral crown. Experts all over the world have observed that the electronic voting machines used in India are the simplest, cheapest and yet the most effective. One EVM costs less than $200. The best part about the EVMs is the ease with which they can be used. The EVMs are easy to maintain, battery operated and do not require electricity for functioning. Elections in India once used around 8,000 tons of paper for printing ballot papers. The massive use of EVMs in the general elections 2004 has saved around 150,000 trees, which would have been felled for the production of ballot lists. What a judicious environmental safeguard! EVMs have not only made the polling process smooth, but also made the counting of votes extremely easy, quick and thoroughly tamper-proof. The icing on the cake is the smooth transfer of power to the winning party. The success of elections in India has attracted huge world attention. On the request of the Commonwealth Secretariat, an Indian electronic voting machine has been provided for display in the office of the Secretary General in London. The Indian mission was, is and will always be from the biggest democracy to the greatest democracy in the world. The Indian bandwagon is on the right track. The people's commitment to electoral democracy has never wavered. It is a homegrown democracy, planted, managed and nurtured by Indians. India, the land of philosophers, has also become India, the land of doers. The initial leaps forward have been taken. Now it's time to sow. In the next elections, Indians with new outlooks, new hopes and new dreams will be asked to decide who they are and to choose where they want to be led and by whom. And the search will begin again. In the words of the legendary Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake.